Good morning, Calvary Chapel people. Let's all stand. I want to wish all the dads a happy Father's Day. I hope that uh, you have a great lunch or dinner, whatever you have planned. I'm excited because uh, I get to spend Father's Day with my dad and both of my parents that came in from 
San Antonio, Texas. So they're in the back back there. So you guys yeah. wave. So that's really exciting for us and because we have childcare again. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we're just excited to see them. They're just, we're having such a great time together. But let's pray and let's just begin our worship time. Lord, we thank you for this morning and just pray that you go before us. May you be glorified, Lord, and happy Father's Day to you as well, Lord. And we remember that every day that you are a father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this out together. Ready? I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious love's atoning Then I repented of my sin
just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do There's not a mountain that He can't move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Just one word You hear what's broken inside me Just one word And you revive every dream Just one touch I feel the power of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that
Be 
Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, turn to someone. Tell them happy Father's Day. Good morning from Calvary Chapel Buell. Thank you so much for stopping by and for tuning in. Here's our weekly announcements. Join us this summer for family camp at Nestor's Campground in Pine, Idaho, June 24th through the 27th. Log on to the Planning Center and sign your family up and order t-shirts if you would like. Join us for lots of fun with fishing, fellowship, friends, food, fireside worship, and of course family. And don't forget the Dutch oven cook-off Saturday night. So you cannot wait to see you guys there. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. This statement made by Jesus is found in Matthew 19, 14, and again in Mark 10, 14. All the little children preschool and daycare is just one of the many fruitful ministries here at Calvary Chapel Buell. 90% of the families who participate in our program are unchurched. This makes the mission field opportunity great. As you can imagine, loving on children produces fertile ground, not only in the lives of the children, but also in the lives of their parents. COVID-19 has been rough on the daycare, but as we get ready to celebrate our 10 year anniversary, we're excited about the new season that God's leading us into. This summer and fall, we'll be looking to fill four to five positions. So if you have a heart to love on babies and toddlers or work with preschool age children, either in the classroom or the daycare room, or maybe fill in as a temporary sub in our kitchen, please contact myself, Stephanie, or my co-director, Lori. You can call us at 208-779-0581, or better yet, come into the office to pick up an application and chat with one of us. 
We're so excited to see what Jesus is going to do in this year and the years to follow. And we invite you to come and be a part of the family here at All the Little Children Preschool and Daycare. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Buell, and guess what? It's summer. We've got several ladies' events going on. This Thursday, June 18th at 6.30, we'll be meeting at Sunset Bowl here in Buell, and we'll be bowling for blessings. We hope you'll join us. And then July, for the Women's Connection, we're doing the salad bar, but it's been moved to the 22nd of July at Teresa Pollard's house. You know it's a great time. So join us if you can, and we'll see you there. And don't forget this summer, we're meeting in the park Wednesdays, 1 o'clock, for Mom Strong. Hey church, we want to welcome you to our first annual Guns vs. Hoses, where the Buell Fire Department is going to challenge the Buell Police Department in a softball match. We'd love to see your guys' support and come and show up, have fun. We're going to have a taco truck out, Kona Ice is going to be there, and please, come and hang out and watch the firefighters challenge the police officers in a softball match. It's going to be July 2nd from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and the game's going to start around 6. There's going to be a dunk take available. There's going to be donations. For a, a hefty enough one, you might be able to get this guy, police chief or the fire chief. We'd also like to welcome you to come check out our canine officer. We're going to have some of our equipment out for you guys to see as well. We are also going to have our brand new ladder truck out for display. We're going to be heading out these hats to children that attend. So please come watch us take the police department to church in a game of softball. The 4th of July is right around the corner and we are looking for people to help decorate the float this year. If you are interested in helping, we are meeting July 1st and 2nd at 6 p.m. at the Miller's house. 953 East, 3700 North in Castle Ford. We're also looking for people to ride on the float on the 3rd. If you are interested, contact Savannah Miller at 208-969-0302. For more information on any of the events going on this summer at Calvary Chapel Buell, check out our website, our mobile app, or our calendar in the foyer. And please join us as we get into the Word. I turned it on. I don't know what to tell you. It's that little red button that says mute. You got to turn that off. <laughs> uh, quick announcement, and then we'll have Phil read the word. Um, we are going to be family camps this week. So uh, I will be heading up to family camp unless I can't fix all my trailer issues by tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to head up tomorrow morning. I'm going to drop Kathy and Joe off, and I'll, I'll be back for Wednesday night service. But I won't be here for coffee with the pastor, so sorry, fellas. You will have to hold your questions for a week, and then we'll, uh, we'll do it the following week. Uh, also, <clears throat> um, wanted to let you know, next Sunday, we have church in the woods. So when we do family camp, we do church up there in the woods, so I'll be up there. <clears throat> there will be a... Won't be the same message out of First John, so if you're not able to come up to the woods, you won't, you won't miss it. Uh, we'll just miss your presence. If you're not able to camp with us and you want to come up Sunday, that would be great. If you stay here, uh, the Bostocks are going to be here that Sunday. They're going to be sharing uh, uh, worship and, uh, and uh, what's going on with their mission. Uh, so we want to encourage you, if you're here, come on to church. Bostocks will be here to uh, to uh, share with us what's going on in Vietnam and the mission work that they've been doing in that regard. I also know they they're moving. Are they in here yet? Where did Rich go? He's in the back. They're uh, I don't know if they're here yet, but they're headed this way. So so I know they sold their house. Did they find a place? Okay. So uh, so anyway, they're gonna they're gonna be our neighbors. So that's pretty cool. So anyways, if you're here next Sunday and you can't come to the woods, Rusty, you are here. It took me a while to, you're sitting somewhere new. You're such a great actor. <laughs> I was just watching that last announcement and I thought, my goodness, what a great actor he is. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be there on the second. I'm going to have to make that. I, uh, who's going to win? <laughs> So do I get to play too? You don't want me on your team. I do what? No, I don't run. 
I do not run. Last time I played softball, when we got here, I played softball. I come around second base, hit a beautiful, would have been a home run for anybody young. <laughs> I rounded second base and pulled my hamstring. <laughs> and I did not make it to third. <laughs> so that was my last time. So anyways, uh, we hope you guys will plug in to the fun stuff we got going on. And uh, I just wanted to take a moment and let you know about some of the things that were going on with Family Camp. Uh, and I'll let Phil come on up and uh, read the word for this morning. We on? Yep. So we're in First John chapter 2, but before I read that, I just want to tell you a little bit about that song that we sang, The Blessing. Uh, that came out, I believe, about a year and a half ago, right at the beginning of covid and the first time I saw that song, it was special because what it is is a word from our Father telling us how much he loves us and cares for us and will get us through any situation. It's called the blessing. And that word really, uh, one of the meanings of that word is a benediction. And that's really what it was. It was a benediction over his children. And we were talking about this a month ago in uh, the men's breakfast, but did you realize there's over 105 benedictions or blessings in the Bible? And so that gives us a lot of hope and assurance, and it shows his love for us. And as we go through 1 John, his command back to us is to be a blessing to, to those all around us, including our enemies. So listen to uh, 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to read the whole chapter, 1 John, oh, it's a long one, 1 John chapter 2, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, and walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world and the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. 
They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If you heard, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that great love that you have for us from the very beginning. Lord, it's uh, the most powerful thing on this earth that you have showed us and, and have asked us to show everyone around us. Lord, we confess that we cannot do it in and of our own strength or will or might, but that we need your anointing. Father, we, we ask this morning that as we get into this very important chapter that, that uh, you would help us to, to be that blessing to those around us. Lord, that you would uh, enable us to bend the knee and humble ourselves and to love those that are unlovely. Father, give us your strength. Give us your heart towards the lost, towards those around us, Father, that defy uh, loving in so many ways. Lord, I just thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that, and your word that is said, if we ask, that you will grant it, Father. So this morning, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to come Lord, to open our eyes and our heart and to fill us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have uh, been trying to finish 1 John chapter 2 for a few weeks. For the third time, my aim is to finish. But I might as well warn you ahead of time, we may only make it a couple of verses. So we will endeavor to persevere. So as we start in 1 John, here's the things we want to keep straight in our mind. It hinges all, it begins all on the concept of the person who makes all the things that John is talking about possible. That is the word of life. Jesus Christ the righteous, our great God and Savior. He is the one who makes it all possible. Then he moves on to the problem that hinders. What is the things that slow us down, that cause us to stumble, that, uh, that are, are impediments in our progress? And he told us that that is sin. But he also told us not only does sin hinder, but we can overcome, right, if we confess our sins. How's it go? He is faithful and just to and cleanse us from. That's right. That's right. The thing that hinders, he is also the word of life has given us victory over and a, a, uh, a path that we ought to follow. Then he went on to tell us the proof that we are in him. He gave two things. One, that we keep 
his commandments. And when we talk about when we keep his commandments, this, this is the thought that runs through my mind. Uh, I hope that it runs through your mind. It is similar to the words of Jesus when he said, I only say the things the Father gives me to say. I only do the things the Father has given me to do. What I'm looking for to come out of me is to say I only do the things that honor or glorify my Father. I only say the things that honor or glorify my Father. I want to follow the example of Christ, right? And too often I make too many excuses for why I don't need to do this or that. I want to do, the Bible says, in everything that you do, do all for the glory of God, right? So that would, doing all for the glory of God would include what we say and do, yes? Jesus said, this is the proof that you are uh, my children, my disciples. You'll keep my commandments. We'll follow the directions he's laid out for us. The second thing he told us is that we would love one another. This is, these are the, the focus that he gives us. You want to know if you belong to me? Here you go. You'll keep my commandments and you'll love one another. Now as he's going on here in chapter 2, he starts with all these reasons why he's writing to us. I'm writing these things to you. For what? To, one, encourage you in spiritual growth. We talked about that last time. I'm writing to you little children. I'm writing to you young men. I'm writing to you fathers. We discussed that last week, so we won't jump into that. The next thing, the next reason he's writing this to us is to expose the dangers of worldliness. And finally, to express the attitudes of the Antichrist. And that's where we'll be this morning. So we're going to pick it up in verse 15. And he gives us an imperative. That's a command. Remember, we go back, proof that you are in him is that you will keep his commandments, right? We're going to keep his, the things he commands. What's he saying? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father. So we go back to the concept that I, I have running through my mind most days, that the things that Jesus said when he said, I'm only going to speak the words the Father wants me to speak. I'm only going to do the things the Father has has called me or directed me to do then when i when i look at this i say look these are the things from the father i want to be focused on things of the father not on things in opposition so when you think about all of these ideas and we're gonna we're gonna hopefully we're gonna unbolt some of this but what i want you to think about with me for a moment is the last uh, the last judge. Well, not Samuel. He technically, I guess, is the last judge. I'm talking about Samson. You guys remember Samson? Samson is one of two miracles that are in Hebrews chapter 11. There are two miracles in Hebrews chapter 11 which give me great hope. Uh, each of them are called faithful or righteous men. One of them is Samson. And the other one is Lot. And I look at those two guys, and I'm pretty sure I have no idea how they made it, how they're considered in the hall of faith, but it gives me hope because I realize that imperfect people are able to please God because we please God by faith. And so we, we're going to just talk about Samson a little bit. When we think about Samson, if you, if you get, want to take some time this week and just look at him, it starts in Judges 13. He goes, I think, from Judges 13 to 16, something like that, kind of encapsulates his life. In the beginning of Samson's life, you have a call from God to Samson's mother. Uh, I don't think we ever get her name. She was barren, and the Lord met her and told her, you're going to have a son. And when you have this son, here's what I want you to do. That your son is going to be set apart for God. So he shall be a Nazarite from birth. 
Now, being a Nazarite meant that you, uh, first off, a Nazarite was a voluntary vow, except for Samson. It was a voluntary vow. That meant that you could make it or you could not make it. But if you make a vow to the Lord, what are you expected to do? If you make a vow, you keep a vow. So a Nazarite vow was, hey, I'm not going to touch the fruit of the vine, which included eating grapes, not just drinking wine. I'm not going to touch the fruit of the vine. I'm not going to eat anything unclean. I won't touch anything that is dead, and I will not cut my hair. Now, there's a reason why the hair is a thing, because the Nazarite vow begins by you shaving all the hair off your body. And now you have a new beginning. And the Nazarite vow continues until you decide at whatever point it's over and you would shave your head or your hair again. And that's, that was the time period of my Nazarite vow. So Samson's mom is given a commandment by God himself. Your son will be set apart and... He is going to be uh, set apart for me, for my use. You know, God says nothing about strength. He just says he's going to be set apart for me. So Samson's mom goes back to Manoah, her, her husband. We have his name. And they go to Manoah. And Manoah says, well, is, is, he, is the guy who told you this still around? I, I need more information. I need more information. He had a desire for for some some greater understanding surely there's got to be something more what is this supposed to look like and so god in his grace is still around and he meets with manoah and he tells manoah exactly the same thing he told samson's mom no new information and part of the lesson in judges 13 is manoah sounded pious he sounded pious by saying, no, I, I want some more information so I do this right. And God, in just repeating the same thing, is saying, I'm not interested in your false piety. I'm interested in your obedience. Uh, you don't need new information. You just need to do the stuff I said. You guys know what I mean? Just, I, just want you to, I just want you to respond to the word that you've already been given. What was the word you've already been given? That raise your son as a Nazarite from birth. So the scripture will tell us this is uh, the way that, that Samson is going to be raised. He wanted, no, he wanted new information, but he didn't get any. No wine or intoxicating drink. No having his hair cut. No contact with a corpse. It is a voluntary act of dedication to God. But Samson... He's going to struggle. If you read chapter 14 of Judges, it starts with, and he saw a pretty girl who happened to be a Philistine, which were enemies of God and served other gods. And so his desire was for her. I, I want to marry this Philistine woman. And mom and dad said, surely you can pick from among your people, Samson. And Samson says, no, I, I've seen what I want and I want her. And the beginning of his struggles come. Though the Lord redeems it. God is, through Samson, judging the Philistines. The story of Samson moves in four acts. It starts, one, with a godly mother. Then it's all women. All the four acts of Samson. The second act, his Philistine wife, chapter 14. The third act, a Gaza prostitute. The fourth act, can you guess her name? Delilah. Oh, you guys know the story. <clears throat> fourth act is Delilah. And Samson becomes a story of exactly what John is talking about in 1 John chapter 2. Don't love the world or the things of the world. What's he... What he does in chapter 14, he lifts up his eyes and he sees a worldly woman who does not have any of the same desires that he has. He does not, she does not want to honor God or live a godly life or be anything about that, but, but he thinks he's in love with her. Then later on, 
he lifts up his eyes and he just sees a prostitute and he goes in with her. And then finally, in the end, he lifts up his eyes to Delilah and it's the first time in the story, if you guys go through and read it, that Samson, he does something different with Delilah that he didn't do with anyone else. He gave his heart away. Here's why that's important. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with? What was the purpose of a Nazarite vow? To be set apart for whom? For the Lord. Samson loved Delilah and he gave his heart away. To her, he spoke the secret. And then Samson is laid upon by the Philistines and he's blinded. But don't feel bad for Samson because he's been living his life by sight and not by faith to this point. When they take his eyes, he's just left how he had always been to that point. He'd been blind. And then they put him as a joke pushing a wheel. Now listen, here's what they did to him. They shaved his hair. How does the Nazarite vow begin? And as he pushes that wheel and he's living in a place where understanding that all the things he chased in the world that he thought was going to be the things that satisfied him, a Philistine woman or, or sexual immorality or finally this, this beautiful girl that lived by the beach. By the way, that's where the Philistines were. And so he... All these things that he thought was going to satisfy him. The first great example he had was a godly mother that scripture doesn't even name. Who honored the Lord and God gave her a son and she raised him the way God instructed her to. And as Samson pushes this wheel, you don't think those things are running through his head? You know, my choices were all made for me. I'm a, uh, you know, I was, a, I, I was born a judge. I didn't get to choose to be a judge. I don't know if I even wanted to be a judge, but here I am. I'm a judge. And, and I, you know, they, they told me that all these things I'm supposed to do for, to be holy. And I want to, I want to try to do those. But, you know, the world has so much other things to offer. So there in his pit of despair, pushing this wheel in a circle with his hair cut off and his eyes taken. Samson sees for the first time. Do you know the scripture tells us that when we walk in darkness, we don't even know what we're tripping over? Now the Philistines, they make a decision. You know what we need to do? We, we need to celebrate the final defeat. Nobody, it, as far as I know, I don't remember the scripture telling us a time frame. They take Samson out of the pit and they bring him to the temple of Dagon to celebrate Dagon's victory over Yahweh. And all the lords of the Philistines are gathered there. And Samson comes to that place. They chain him between two pillars. And nobody notices because he's just a big joke that now he has a Nazarite vow he owns. So when he prays, Lord, give me strength one more time. And he pulls the pillars down in the temple of Dagon. It's a big deal. The temple of Dagon, the deity of the Philistines, they're on the beach. It all comes falling down and it, and it wipes out all the leadership of the Philistines. One fell swoop. But you know what it spoke to everyone else? Yahweh was not defeated by Dagon. Samson had faith in God, but he struggled with a desire for the world his whole life. But that's not where the story ends. Usually that's where people stop talking, but he was dead. His body left in the temple of Dagon. Judges 16.31 says, 
Then his brothers and his family came down, and they took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. So his end wasn't in the temple of Dagon. He was buried with his fathers. <clears throat> this is why the writer of Hebrews would say, hey, Samson, the time fails me to tell you of the faith of Samson. And people read the story and they think, where's all the faith? I just see all the mistakes. Isn't that really the record that we think of all the time? When I, If I say David to you, you're going to be torn between two events in his life. David killed Goliath or David sinned with Bathsheba, right? But the Lord, he just sees the faith. You know, David is called the man after God's own heart because he never once on the pages of Scripture worshipped an idol. Samson's great fall, the last fall with Delilah, was because he replaced a love for God with a love for Delilah, and he gave his heart away. So when John is writing this section and he says to us, listen, do not love the world or the things of the world because you can't have it both ways. You cannot love the world and love the Father. You cannot love the world and love God. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. You can't have both. They are diametrically opposed. We can't have both. And when we talk about the world, it's interesting because I can't remember, I don't remember the number, something like a 170 times the word cosmos is used in the Bible, the majority of which are by John. And so John really defines the term. And when we're looking at this idea of what does it mean to love the world, he's not talking about loving a waterfall or a scenic beauty or seeing something. He's talking about the whole system in opposition to God. He's talking about the exact same thing that happened to Samson. That he, he loved, he wanted to have what he knew God said is bad. I want that Philistine girl, she's beautiful. I want that prostitute because I just want what I want. Oh, Delilah, finally she's the one. And if you read all the stories, don't you feel like Samson's a little dumb? Like you, you, she's asked you over and over again, you tell her she's done all the things to try to take away your strength and you keep giving it away. Yeah, because when we fall in love with the world, the things in opposition to God, we're dumb. We do dumb things. And so what's the point John's saying? Look, love for the Father, that's not in you if you love the world. If you're loving the world, or the, if you love the things in opposition to God, when Jesus said that he came and he did not come to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved, he said, this is why the world's condemned. That the light has come, but men love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. It's not that men didn't know Jesus was the light. They knew Jesus was the light. They didn't want the light. They wanted the dark. Here, when we look at the scripture, he's saying, this is the idea. This is what John is calling the world. Are you in love with your darkness? Are you in love with your sin? I shared a couple of weeks ago that I had a struggle with bitterness. And I used to, I remember laying in bed at night, sometimes not being able to sleep because I'm replaying the things I'm bitter about over in my head. And my bitterness became a, a comfortable friend that was slowly poisoning me to death. Is that the way you think of your sin? She's just a pretty girl from uh, the wrong side of the tracks. But this was the destruction of, of Samson. We want to understand. We don't want to walk in the things that are of the world. He describes it in three parts. One, the desire of the flesh. Two, the desire of the eyes. Three, the pride of life, right? These are the three things that make up the love of the world. 
the lust of the eyes, being ruled by your desires, the desires specifically of your flesh, right? Being ruled by the desires of your flesh, which, by the way, there are no redeeming qualities of. Right? The, the works of the flesh are evident. Read Galatians chapter 5. You're not going to look at any of those things that are listed in Galatians 5 and go, oh, that's admirable. No. The desires of the flesh, they are not admirable. It's being ruled by your sinful desires. Now listen to what the Word of God says. And I want you to think about Manoah saying, I just need more information, you know, and the Lord coming and saying, you already got everything you need. In Psalms 37, verse 4, and by the way, the entire chapter of Psalm 37 is a great one to look at, but Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I want my desires to be ruled by God. Then the key to having my desires ruled by God is for me to delight in the Lord or for me to love God. If I love God, he's going to put desire, spiritual desire in my heart, not sinful desire. I love, that's why it's the first commandment. Because everything's going to come out of that. It, it, we're going to love God. We want to love God. He will change our desire. Or I will be ruled by the desire of my flesh. I have been there before. Anybody else live their life by the desire of the flesh? And how did that work out? Yeah, it wasn't great, right? wasn't great. No, it was, it was leading to my own destruction. This first, the lust of the flesh, is dealing with our depravity, our desire for sin. The second one he talks about is the lust of the, of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. This is dealing with our desires. Again, uh, but it's allowing the world, what the world shows us, to trump what God tells us. Allowing what the world shows us to trump what God tells us. I just need some more information. No, the Lord told you, you know what is good. You know. The Lord has told us the lust of the eyes. When we talk about Eve, you remember the fall. We see the fall of man. What did she do? She first wanted to be wise. Then she looked upon the fruit and saw that it was desirable look good every commercial every tv show every movie every book every song everything that this world produces and presents before you is designed to make you unsatisfied with the lord all of it it wants to say half god really said no, that's not really bad. Let me show you how good it looks. Let me show you how, how good it will feel. Let me show you what the blessing is. And so it's allowing, the lust of the eyes is allowing what the world shows you to trump what God told you. These are the love of the world. Our depravity, the lust of the flesh, our desire, the lust of the eyes, and finally, our dependency. The pride of life. The pride of life is a little confusing, and I, I am not very good at pronouncing the Greek word, so you'll take my word for it, I'm sure. Uh, you guys can uh, um, learn how to say it on your own. What it means is it's not referring to conceit. It's referring to confidence in your own abilities now when i look at these things guys and we've been we were talking a, a couple of weeks ago and i and i i've heard i can't even tell you how many times i've heard this thing in the church in the last uh 12 years for certain um gosh why why does the church you know quote in in quotes that's air quotes the church the body of christ why does it all seem so weak 
Well, to be honest, because we're nurturing sin and we're not confessing it. We're, we're laying in bed being warmed by the things that we're supposed to shun. And we're struggling to love the Father, to love God with all our heart because our hearts are divided because I really love this woman that I know she's not a believer. Or I really love this guy. Well, I know she, he's not a believer, but he'll probably become one. Maybe. Has God spoken in that regard? But we don't want to listen because we love our sin. We love our darkness. And we comfort ourselves with saying we, we know the truth, right? I, I know what the Bible says. And yes, in my, in my, I, I have intellectual assent. I believe that Jesus is who he said he is. But listen to what Jesus said. He said, why do you call me Lord? But you don't do what I ask. What does that mean? Lip service is the easiest thing of all things to give. And none of us are satisfied with lip service from a friend. Are we? No, we get irritated by friends like that. Oh, it's just lips. You say you'll be there and they never show up, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? So we don't, we don't want that kind of friend. So we look at it, and, but, but is that the relationship we have with Christ? This is why the Bible calls us to self-examination. It's one of the things we talked about at the men's breakfast this weekend. Because we need to be considering these things. Why is John telling us these things? Is my hope in me? Do I manipulate all the situations around me to get the outcome I want because my hope is in me? And I can't, you know, I can always tell if someone is, is submitted to, to a thing. Wait a minute. I was going to wipe it, but look, I'm going to do it right. I got a cloth for wiping my glasses. <laughs> it's a good thing. But I, I, I'm learning new habits. I'm learning to do that and not be sarcastic, which my wife is celebrating. So <laughs> when, we, when we look at this, is my trust in me, my ability to manipulate what's going on? Is, is that what I'm doing? I, that's the pride of life. So we have three things, our depravity, our desire, and our dependency. Is my dependency on Christ? I can test it because when the Lord does something I don't like, is my immediate thing to go figure out how to make it happen anyway. Is that what I try to do? Like, you ever heard no from, you know, nobody likes to hear no? Nobody. But, when you hear no from the Lord, are you able to just say, okay, God said no. God said no. Or am I swallowed up by my own gifts and talents and abilities and my manipulate the situation for me? This is the love of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride in myself. So the, Lord's, the Lord is speaking through John saying, don't let this be in you. Don't let this be in you. Do not love the world. Now when you hear that phrase, just go to the three. Do not live by the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and pride in yourself. Because this, if you do in that, you cannot love the Father. That's important. Now, here's what happens, guys. We, we do this thing where we come up to the mirror of God's word, and God's word will reflect something on us, and maybe it will impact us, and we'll say, wow, that's, that's really deep or something I need to think about. And it, at the Bible, the book of James says, it's like a man who looked in a mirror, and he saw the dirt on his face, and then he turns away from the mirror, and he forgets, I was supposed to do something about that dirt, Right? 
What's the thing that hinders us? Sin. What do we do about that? Confess. And what will our great God and Savior do? Well, he, he has already forgiven, right? When Jesus died on the cross, we were washed clean. Yes? For sure. We're washed clean. Our sins are forgiven us. But in, in the act of sanctification, walking through this world, I need to recognize that God wants me to confess these things to him so he can deliver me. I need delivered from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of these things are temporary. Everything that Samson chased was temporary, right? The first marriage of the Philistine girl, how'd that work out? Bad. The prostitute, how'd that work out? Bad. Delilah, how'd that work out? Bad. Okay, so none of those things um, lasted, right? Not one of those things lasted. None of them was real. Because what the world does is it lies to you and it paints a beautiful picture of some incredible thing that it promises and then you jump in and find out it's none of that. It's none of those things. And you're left with a shell. Listen to what it says, verse 17 of 1 John 2. The world is passing away along with its desires. None of it lasts. None of it lasts. It's not staying but whoever does the will of God, what's he say? Abides forever. What's he contrasting? Temporary with permanent. The love of God, relationship with the Lord, that is permanent and beautiful and lasting. And the world, it's just lies. Don't fall for the lies of the world. The scripture would tell us in Romans 12, verse 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what purpose? That by testing you might discern what is the will of God, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That is exactly what John's talking about when he says, hey, this is what abides. The world's passing away, but whoever does the will of God, he abides forever. Don't settle for temporary. Don't be conformed. Don't get sucked down the drain by all of these things. Now you decide how much of that you should let in. Right? I had a lady one time who told me, you know, Jackie, you decide how much of that stuff you want to let in. And then she told me a story. She said, I make the best brownies on earth. Oh, I like brownies. You guys like brownies? I like edges. You can, if you come to my house and Kathy has made brownies, you won't find any edges. If she cuts them all up, I cut off the edges. And then I steal them all. <laughs> There's no edges. So she said, I, I make brownies, and, and everybody loves my brownies, and I only put a little bit of dog feces in it. It's just a little. In fact, I have some here. Do you want them? No. No, thanks. I'm not even tempted by the edges in that. Listen, when you think about how much of the world you're letting in, that's the same thing you're doing. It's good brownies. There's just a little poop in them. <laughs> how much do you want? Some of us have been eating sheets and sheets of that stuff. <laughs> You're going to go home after church and you're going to turn on TV and let some more in. On your way home, you're going to pop in some music and you're going to say, I just like the beat. You're going to do all those things. And you're just going to let that corrosion from the world in in all those different ways. And then you say, how did I get here? How did I get to this place? 
Now look, I don't want to be I don't want us to be confused. Our darkness lives inside of us. But the more we pour in, the bigger it gets. You with me? So you got to make those decisions. How much of this am I How much of this am I going to eat? Oh, it looks good. That's the lust of the eyes. I want it. That's the lust of the flesh. A little won't hurt me. That's the pride of life. I hope if we think about those things, we will understand the promise of Paul in Romans 12. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. How am I transformed? Well, what if you did the opposite? How much of the word of God do you let in a week? A day. How much of the, the praise of God do you let in? How much of the light are you letting in your life? And how much darkness? We get to choose those things, don't we? Listen to what John says. Do not love the world. Now he goes on in verse 18. He says, now children, it's the last hour. We find ourselves in the last days. Anybody doubt we're in the last days? I just want you to know, the same time we say yes, every generation before us has been able to say yes too. Right? Because every generation has felt what we're feeling. I think we're the right ones, but I don't know. But here's what I want you to understand. Here's what, he, here's what John wants us to focus on in the reality that we're in the last days, right? The last days began at the, at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We entered into the final period of time in earth's history called the last days. We're in the last days. And when John says we're in the last hour, he's like, we're at the end of the last days. Are you guys with me? We're at the end of the last days. Here's what he said. You've heard Antichrist is coming. Holy cow. I can get, if I say, I'm going to do a prophecy update, I can fill the building with all the people who want to hear all my suppositions on how this is all going to wrap up. John says, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, right? This is the big A Antichrist, the one spoken of in Thessalonians, the one spoken by Daniel, the one Jesus talked about. There will be a final world uh, ruler who will lead the world in a final rebellion against God, which Jesus Christ will return and put down and set up his kingdom and the end of wickedness and the reign of righteousness forever will take place. This is the king that we are looking for his return. He says, you've heard that he is coming, but listen, there's a lot of antichrist here. Now again, he's laying out, he wants us to understand what is really the attitude of antichrist. We think, and this is true, but we think antichrist only means anti, against. So everything that's against Christ, and really our world is anti, right? anti-Christian, anti-the Lord, really against. But I want you to understand the one that we, that we let sneak in. Anti also means, in, in the Greek word, it also means pseudo, which is in the place of. In other words, the spirit of antichrist is anything that is taking the place of our Christ. He says, the spirit of Antichrist is already here. He said, we're waiting for the big guy who's going to come and the end of the world will take place at the, at the tribulation period and everybody's wanting to know when that's happening. And John says, look, the spirit of Antichrist is here in Ephesus right now. John wrote that 2,000 years ago. It has not changed. These pseudo-Christ, these things that will take the place of Christ. This is how he says, I know it's the last hour. It's the last hour because of the opposition from the enemy about what Jesus Christ is doing. What is this attitude? He goes on in verse 19. He says, they went out from us. So he's speaking personally of a group of people that left Ephesus, okay, who didn't like John, 
They left the church at Ephesus to start another work. It said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have stayed with us. They didn't stay. They left. This attitude of antichrist, pseudo-Christ, people wanting to take the place of Christ. And the place of Christ can be taken by a lot of different things. You can, you can substitute Christ with a program. This is what we're going to do. This program is going to be Christ for us. This is our system. This is our, this is our way, the way that we do things. There's a lot of things that we can put in instead of Jesus Christ. Now, in Ephesus, these, this group of people couldn't get traction. And they left. And John said, that's how we know they're not a part of us. Because they didn't stay with us. You can join a body. You can be a part of what's going on and never really be a part of what's going on. They had a different mission. They had a different concept. And John's going to talk about this in each one of the epistles that he writes, they went out from us, they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have stayed. But they left. They went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. Sometimes people leave because they are not of us. And I know people, they get, they get upset, such and such left or so and so left or they're not coming to church anymore and I'll get a couple of phone calls. You got to find out where they went, what's going on. And John said to these guys, and, and sometimes it's people struggling in sin, right? That stuff happens. We want to reach out and love on people and, and try to, to bring back people. I want to follow the example of Christ, right? He told me about a good shepherd leaving 99 and going after one. You guys remember? I happened to be one of those one once, so I appreciate it. So I, I want to have that attitude, but he's saying, no, these guys, they were never of us. They were, they had come with an attitude of antichrist, a pseudo-Christ attitude. They want to take the place, the position, the authority, but they were not about Jesus Christ. The attitude of antichrist was a part of what was going on. Now he's going to tell them how they can discern. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. You have the unction, the, I think King James puts it, the unction of the Holy Spirit. The anointing, you have the anointing, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have given your life to Christ, you have surrendered your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit is in you. And the Holy Spirit being in you has anointed you and you have all, you all have knowledge. You have the knowledge of the Holy Spirit residing within you. So he says in verse 21, I write to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Now when we think about these things, I want to be able to discern. I want to see the discernment of the Holy Spirit in my life. Don't separate what we're doing from what we just talked about in the love of the world, because John didn't. It's all in the same chapter. Don't separate it from the idea of growing and progressing with Christ because John didn't separate it. This is all in chapter 2. And just so you know, for John, this is all one, one, one time of speaking. All of this was part of his message. So as he's laying this out, we don't want to separate it. We don't want to take it apart. We want to go, what is the source? What is the source of discernment in our life? It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And what will he guide me in? Scripture says, all things. And he will separate what? He's going to separate truth from lies. How do I know truth? Truth, our anchor to truth is the word of God. It is the only objective anchor a believer possesses. If you throw that out, you are throwing away your foundation and you are standing on shifting sand. You have no solid footing. Jesus said, even to Pilate, right? When Pilate was saying, he was, he was talking about truth and Pilate said, 
kid as veritas. What is truth? And he walked away. He was standing right next to truth incarnate, wasn't he? Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God. He's the, he's the representative of the word of God. The word of God came to me, the prophets all said. The word of God came to me. Word of God came to me. All of these referencing Jesus Christ, the righteous, he will help us, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us. He will lead us into the Spirit of truth, but that is through his word. It is not a magical, subjective ideal. Do you understand what I mean? Sometimes people think it's a magical, subjective reality. In other words, you just have a, a thought enters into your mind that something is true. That's totally subjective. Because if you have another person who says, I have this magical thought that entered into my mind, and this is truth, and they're not the same, one of you is what? Thank you. Yeah, one of you is wrong. And the reality of the statement that you're making is subjective. I can't anchor it to a foundation. The foundation that we anchor to is the word of God. And the word of God delivers, just like what the other day when we talked about the law of God. The law of God is a judicial law. It's not intended to give us everything about every possible situation like Justonian law would. It's intended to say, hey, I should be able to look at what God's word says and be able to discern the right way to act in a given situation because of the similarities. I'm not talking about getting saved by the law. I'm just talking about understanding what is good. Right? Everybody's okay? It's good not to murder your neighbor? So we can all understand when it's good to, to walk in the statutes that God lays out for us. I want the word through the spirit. The spirit is going to give us the anointing through the word to understand truth from lie. That's how that will function in our lives. Let's take a look. He says, now, who is the liar? He's saying, what, what is a denier of truth? Now, don't, please don't separate this from the earlier section that said they left us because these are probably the reasons why they left. You guys with me? He says, who is the liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ? So the Bible teaches us Jesus is the anointed one, the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the King. He is the promised one of Daniel chapter 9, the one that would save the, the people from their sins, the great deliverer, the king who is to come. All of those things are wrapped up in the idea of Jesus being the Christ. So we don't deny that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the promised holy one that scripture talks about. So who is the liar? The one that denies it, who says Jesus is not the Christ. This is antichrist in opposition to or pseudo sometimes they want to take that role why would you deny jesus christ well because you want to say i'm jesus christ and before you tell me that doesn't happen we've seen it in our own lifetime haven't we multiple times how many crazy people burning in buildings because of of other crazy things were in that position because they're following a false messiah over and over and over again, if we hold to the foundation of truth, we'll know the spirit of Antichrist, the liar who says that Jesus is not the Christ. He who denies the Father and the Son. This is important. No one who denies the Son has the Father. No one who denies the Son. This is a big problem with a lot of cults and isms today. Because there are a lot of people who will deny the Son. I'm, we're going to explain it here in just a moment. In verse 23, he's, he's telling us what is the important part. Listen, no one who denies the Son has a Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Homo legeo. Whoever says the same thing about Jesus that he said about Himself. That's what it means to confess Jesus Christ. That he is who he said he is. That he is the son of God. That's a proclamation that he is the king. That he is God in the flesh. 
For in him dwells the fullness of deity in bodily form. That's straight out of the word. He is God in the flesh. He is the king. He is the Christ. Whoever confesses the son has the father also. If you deny the son in any way that he proclaimed himself, you do not have the father. You cannot have one without the other. The triune God is inseparable. You don't get one piece and it's okay. One comes with all. Indivisible. Indivisible. You cannot have only the Son and not the Father, only the Father and not the Son. Each of those attitudes, each of those that move away from the essential confession of who Christ is, is the spirit or attitude of Antichrist. That is already here in John's day, right? He's warning us, right? Warning us about the love of the world, warning us that we want to progress and grow in Christ, warning us that we would understand the attitude of Antichrist. So he goes on <clears throat> about the dwelling of truth in us in verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. <clears throat> if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. What's he talking about? He's talking about the doctrines that they have received from the apostles. That's why I say the word of God is our foundation of truth because that's the document that brings to you and I the word of the apostles. So you guys all know the apostles are dead, right? John was the last one. There are no more apostles and, and there are no more prophets. I'm talking about big P and big A. There's no one who has authority to speak for God in that way. They have all passed. They have given to us what we have in our laps that we study as the word of God translated and delivered to us throughout history. It's a really amazing discussion that I don't have time for. But you guys can ask me about it next Monday and we'll delve into it a little bit. This is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. We hold fast. John says, you're not following uh, cunningly devised fables. You're following eyewitness accounts of the men who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and held his hand and sat beside him and ate with him and discussed things with him. This is what we're following. This is what we're looking at. And the path of eternal life is a part of this. So I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Stay in the truth. It always makes me nervous when somebody says, I have something brand new to share with you. Just makes the hackles rise up a little bit. What do you mean brand new? We have the word of God. We want to hold fast to what God's word is teaching and not be deceived. So the spirit can teach us through the word to hold fast to truth and abide in Christ. And if we abide in Christ, he abides in me. Hallelujah. That's the position we want to be in, right? And then I know that I am walking with Christ. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. You have no need that anyone should teach you. He's saying you are able to do this yourself. You don't have to come to the apostle John and have him get out his spoon. He's saying you have this. You have the Holy Spirit in you and you have the word of God. You have the necessary tools to comprehend. Don't be lazy and say, I can't understand it. It just requires a little bit of effort. And you can have the same, you have the same tools everyone else has. You don't have to have gone to a cemetery, I mean seminary. You don't have to have done, you don't have to have, sorry, that was a cheap shot. You don't have to have done Bible college and all this. I'm not saying those things are bad, but I am saying you have the tools. You have the spirit and the word of God. Amen? You are able, you have him abiding in you, uh, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Stay in the truth. 
Stay in the truth. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shriek away in shame at his coming. Nobody wants to be ashamed when Jesus returns, right? No, man, I, that's not what I want. I want, to, I want to be lifting my eyes up and looking for my Savior because I love him, not the world, because I'm progressing, I'm growing in understanding, because I'm growing up, right? This is what he's talking about in chapter 2, because I'm, I'm understanding that I don't want to let the spirit of Antichrist in where I'm looking for truth in a hundred different places from other people. No, I, I have the spirit within me and the word of God. I want to be a diligent student who is understanding what God's word is laying out for us. So now, little children, abide in him. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. There are certain things, <clears throat> certain attributes of Christ that are reflected in the lives of believers. So when he says, if you see somebody who's righteous, it's not, this is not our judgment of somebody who's a good person. This is the idea that says, oh, there's someone who has been with Jesus. You remember when the disciples, they get brought in and they're, they're beat by the same Sanhedrin that, that killed Jesus and they're answering the Sanhedrin instead of running from them and they're, the, the Sanhedrin says, We're, we tell you, you can no longer say Jesus' name anymore. And the same dudes who all run away from that Sanhedrin stood in front of them and said, look, whether you think we should obey God or you, you decide, but we're preaching Jesus. And it says the Sanhedrin said, these guys were with Jesus because there was something in them that was seen so that you could say, oh, they've been with Jesus. You've been spending time in God's word. You've been spending time in, with his spirit. And we can see that reflection, right? We can see those things coming through. And this is what John's talking about. This is what we want. These are the attitudes we want of the person who is abiding in Christ. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Look at that. It's not 12 yet. <laughs> Father God, we are so thankful of who you are. We're so thankful that you have given us your son, we are so thankful that he, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation of the world. So thankful, Lord, that you are the truth, that you are the way, that you are the one that I desire to follow with all my heart, that I, I only want to say things that glorify you. So help me, God, not to make excuses, not to, you know, do all the things I've ever done, but just help me bring every thought captive in Christ and speak words that glorify God. Help me do things that honor you, God, that glorify you, to walk a life that says, I am different. I'm different because I have chosen Christ. I put my faith and trust in him. I have laid down the burden of my life and I have exchanged all the stuff that the world promises. I've laid all of those things aside and all I want is you. I want you, Lord Jesus, to be Lord of my life. I want to walk in obedience to the things you want me to do. I don't want to argue about them. I just want to, I'm just going to do the simple ones, the ones easy to understand. You said, love your enemy. Do good to those who despitefully use you. I don't have to wonder what that means. I know what that means. You challenge me, Lord, to, to love my wife like you love me. You challenge me, Lord, to love my brothers and sisters in Christ like you love me. You challenge me, Lord, to love the Father like you love the Father. But Lord, you don't just throw those challenges out. 
you have also said, it is good that I go away, because if I go, I will give you a helper. Someone who will help you stand in the truth, understand the truth, walk in the truth. Someone through which you can receive the power that says, God, help me overcome my failure, my flesh, the lust of my eyes, the lust of my flesh. <clears throat> Give me deliverance from the pride of life. Some of us here today, maybe we're like Samson and we find ourselves blinded and in a pit. But that's not the end of the story. Being blinded in a pit is the beginning. It's the end of my own pride and all that, and it's the beginning of me saying, Lord, I trust you. I can't see anything. I don't need to see anything. I just need to see you. There are probably times in that pit, Samson looked up and lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Lord, thank you for making me blind. I'm not distracted now. There are probably times Samson lifted his eyes and said, Lord, thank you for this quiet time pushing this wheel, grinding grain. So God, teach us. Teach us to learn to be satisfied in you. For you are eternal. You are perfect. You are good. You are everything we need. We just can't understand it. Blind our eyes to the lies of the world. Blind our, our eyes, deafen our ears to the sounds of Antichrist. God, we want to see your church walk and exist and do all that she is to do in the power of your spirit. But God, your, your church to a wide extent is floundering in darkness. We don't know what to do or where to go or what to say. So in 1 John, you tell us, okay, first, stop lying and saying you're in the light. Confess that you're in the darkness and let me bring light. Now grow. Grow. Mature. Turn your heart away from the world and give your heart to Christ. Don't allow the lies of Antichrist to misdirect you or deceive you walk in the truth of his word by the power of his spirit and you will see the victory of God flow through his church in the land of the living you will see it in your day because you have made the choice to walk in obedience to him so God, we just pray that you would deliver us. Open our eyes, open our ears, soften our heart, help us walk in an attitude of confession and repentance, being made holy by your spirit, moment by moment, so that we can say, I speak words that glorify my Father. I do things that glorify my great God and Savior so that you, Lord, will be glorified in who we are before the world. And may they see and be challenged in their blindness. We lift this day to you and we give you praise for you are a perfect father to us. May the fathers in this room choose to follow your example and be glorified in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our prayer team come on up. If you need prayer this morning for whatever it may be, we welcome you to come up during this last song. I just want to pray again this blessing over you guys before you're dismissed. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Sing it one more time. Lord, bless you. Make his 